So just to start here, what is a black hole? Um, and roughly speaking, this is an object which is, has a gravitational field. Well, we all have gravitational fields. Everything with a mass has a gravitational field. Um, but it's something with a gravitational field so strong that if you get close enough to it, nothing can escape it, not even light. In this talk, I'm going to be exploring this concept a little bit and seeing what kinds of things happen near black holes. But first, before getting there, how do we form a black hole? Um, or what does it mean to say that um, nothing, not even light, can escape? Um, so you could think of, OK, if you take a ball and you throw it up, um, the ball will come down. Um, but of course, if you throw this up very, very quickly, far more quickly than you could with your hand, um, it will never come back. Um, so this is the speed that it would take to uh, escape from the gravitational field of the Earth. You can determine what this is, and to escape from the Earth, you need to throw the ball up at about 40,000 kilometers per hour, so I can't do that with my hand. Um, but we have rockets, of course, that can do this, and we have sent out probes which have escaped the Earth's gravity. Um, you could ask a similar thing for the Sun. Um, so if we start from the Earth and try to escape the Sun's gravitational field, um, we need to actually go quite a bit faster. Um, about 500 times faster to escape the gravitational field of the sun. Um, we can't exactly do that directly, although we have sent a couple of probes which um, are basically escaping the gravitational field of the sun. They are leaving the solar system, um, but this wasn't sort of done in one go from the Earth. You sort of had a rocket fire for a while, and then you had some flybys with various planets, which gave, this, um, gave these probes boosts, and eventually they were able to uh, escape or they are on the path to escape the solar system. Um, so just for fun, you could also ask, what is your escape velocity? Um, so you have a gravitational field, you have mass. Um, and of course, it's not very noticeable in everyday life. And you could see, all right, your escape velocity is about uh, 10 to the minus 4 kilometers per hour. So almost nothing. Um, and of course, this is why you don't notice your own gravitational field um, in everyday life. You need sensitive equipment to actually see that. But it is there. So OK, if you have some solid object, or not necessarily solid, wouldn't call the sun solid, but let's say you get closer and closer to the sun, well, as close as you can get to it is the surface of the sun. right? Um, so OK, if you want to get, uh, in some sense, closer than the surface of the sun, well, you need to actually shrink the surface of the sun. You need to keep the same mass, but have a smaller object. OK, so let's take something, and let's try to squish it. Um, so let's try to squish the sun. If you do this enough, and you really need to do this a lot, then eventually your escape velocity will get to the speed of light. Um, how much do you actually need to do this? Uh, so all right, you can take the sun there. Um, and if you squish its volume a factor of a million, you get from the sun to the Earth. So the Earth is a lot smaller than the sun. Um, but we're keeping the same mass here. Somehow we have some process that's going to squish the sun a factor of a million. Um, but that's not nearly enough. Um, so even if we do that, we still, light can still easily escape from such an object. Um, so we need to actually squish it even a factor of 10 billion more than that. Um, so we need to basically take all of the mass of the sun um, and um, place it in this little region here. So um, basically filling up some small part of Dublin. If you were to actually place the mass of the sun in the small part of Dublin, of course, Dublin wouldn't be there anymore. This is what you would need to turn the sun into a black hole. Um, so that sounds crazy, right? How could you possibly do that? Um, if we just take a normal object in everyday life, well, and you try to squish it, you can't squish it like that. It's just never going to work. Um, and you know, you could try it with a with a press or something like that. Really squish something hard. Not going to get anywhere near there. Um, you could use explosives to try to compress something, like the explosives that you have in uh, uh, to trigger nuclear weapons. Um, that's still not even close to being able to work. Um, so you need something on astrophysical scales. Um, but basically, what can happen um, is if you have a large star, once it dies. Um, it can start to contract, and basically it runs out of fuel, and the gravitational field of this gas is pulling it in. It's trying to push it in. Um, but when the star is still alive, its temperature is basically holding it up. It's pushing it out. The gravity is pulling it in. And for something like the sun, this is basically an equilibrium. Um, but once the fuel runs out, well, various complicated things happen. Um, but at least for a very massive star, after uh, fireworks and so on, um, the gravity starts to win, and it starts to pull the star in. Um, and if you take a ball of gas and you start to collapse it inwards, of course, the pressure increases. Like if you take a balloon and you try to squeeze it, 
eventually it will stop. It, it moves in a little bit, it compresses a little bit, but then it stops because the pressure inside the balloon has increased and that's counteracting the force that you're applying from your hands. But something interesting that happens that we learned about when we learned about uh, general relativity, so our best current understanding of how gravity works, um, is that it's not only mass that creates gravity. So this is what, what Newton discovered, is that mass creates gravity, and that's true. But mass is not the only thing that creates gravity. Um, another thing that creates gravity is pressure. So if you have a star and it's under pressure, that pressure gravitates as well. And if you have a star that is contracting, um, and that pressure is increasing to counteract the contraction, as that pressure increases, the gravitational field of the star increases because that pressure is gravitating. Um, and in most cases, this uh, gravitational field of pressure is very, very small. It's completely negligible. But in these very extreme cases where you have large stars, it's possible, actually, for the pressure to increase that increases the gravitational field, and it increases the gravitational field so much that that actually um, uh, basically causes the inward force on this gas to um, always win over the outward force from the pressure of the gas. And you have a sort of runaway reaction. Now, what does a black hole do? Um, black holes do lots of things. Um, but all right, so it says nothing can escape, at least if you get too close. Um, and in, in popular culture, people often think about black holes as, as something that um, suck you in. And um, well, that's not really true. Uh, so here we have um, some observations of these are my only observations in this talk. I'm a theorist. Um, so these are, these are observations of uh, stars in the center of our galaxy, or very close to the center of our galaxy. Um, and these are observations that were taken over a very long time, so 1995 to 2014. And basically, we're looking at these stars were moving very slowly. Um, and you could see them actually tracing out uh, these nice orbits here. Some of these stars haven't actually completed a full orbit because we haven't waited long enough. Um, but what you can see um, is that all of these things are orbiting over something in the center here, and the something is completely invisible. But if you calculate what that, the mass of that something, it is some millions of times the, so the mass of our sun. It is something absolutely enormous in terms of mass, but you can't see anything there, and it's very, very tiny. For these observations and other things, uh, these two uh, Gainsel and Ghez were awarded the Nobel Prize in physics uh, a few years ago. Um, so what they were able to establish was that there is actually a giant black hole at the center of our galaxy. Now when you look at this, you see all of these orbits are basically things that would have been familiar to uh, Newton. The scales would have amazed him, but if you just look at the picture, you would say, okay, these are normal sorts of orbits. They would be familiar to Newton or Kepler or people like this. They're just ellipses that go like this over and over. There's nothing dramatic, and in particular, these stars are not falling in. OK, but if you get much closer, right? so that was a very challenging observation there. Those stars are very, very close. So let's try to get closer, or let's imagine getting closer. And let's suppose that you have some uh, spacecraft here that's getting really close to your black hole. And you could ask, well, what kind of orbit does it move on? So it does uh, rather more interesting things. Uh, and if you wait long enough, um, actually, this will basically fill up all of the space in between these two circles. Um, so you don't just get something that's moving in a simple shape over and over and over, but it's moving in this complicated way uh, in between these two uh, radii. Uh, but one thing that's not happening is it's never falling in. It's always, staying, it's always staying above this minimum radius. So still, you're not falling in. One other kind of thing that's kind of neat, um, you can add a little bit of energy to this. So you take your, your spacecraft and you put yourself in a slightly different orbit. Um, and you still have the same sort of thing that um, you're not falling in, uh, but you have these kinds of interesting orbits where you zoom around very close to the black hole for a little bit, and then you whirl outwards. These are called zoom whirl orbits. So you have this quick zoom there. You whirl around slowly, quick zoom here, maybe once, maybe a few times, whirl out again. But if you get really, really close, then things are even more interesting, or then you can fall in. So suppose that you're really close, you're on an almost circular orbit, but you get a little bit of a nudge. So this is not falling in now. You get a little bit of a nudge, and you actually fly away. But suppose that you nudge yourself in the other direction. Instead of giving a nudge uh, this way, you give a little bit of a nudge that way. 
All right, you're on your, your almost circular orbit. Okay, oh, and then you're gonna fall in, and then you die. Now there are other things that you might need to worry about. You might need to worry about the gravitational field of the, um, uh, of the black hole uh, stretching you or squeezing you to death. Um, now this doesn't happen for black holes like the ones at the center of our galaxy. It turns out that big ones are less dangerous, counterintuitively. Um, but ones that are, let's say, formed from the collapse of um, uh, ordinary-ish stars, so let's say 10 times the mass of our sun, um, those will rip you apart as you get close. Um, so there's all kinds of interesting things that black holes do to light. Um, so black holes bend light, or actually everything bends light. Gravity bends light, just as it um, bends the trajectories of, of massive objects, it also bends light. Um, but these effects are much more dramatic for black holes. Um, and if you just look at, so if you have a black hole that's, that's sitting there and you have a whole bunch of stars behind it, this is a um, simulation of what things might look like. Um, and one thing in particular that you could see is this ring here. Um, this is called the Einstein ring. Um, and basically what you have uh, in this case is you have a massive, um, sorry, you have a bright object which is directly behind your black hole. So there's a bright object here, the black hole is here, and you're directly viewing on the opposite side. And what's happening is that uh, light from this uh, object is coming around the black hole like this. It's being bent, it's being lensed like this into your eyeball here, but it can also do it like this, or like this, or like this, and that's viewed as producing this ring here. And in fact, if you have things that aren't so perfectly aligned, what you have is if you have, let's say you pick this star here, and I'm not going to be able to pick the corresponding star, um, but there's more than one image of it. So this star will be showing up in this picture more than once. So basically what's going to happen is if you have this light source here and you have, okay, some, let's say you have a person viewing over here, you have light going from here to here directly, but you're also going to have light that wraps around the black hole and then comes to the person once. That's going to be viewed as having two separate stars. It's really the same physical star, but you see two images. Or you can have the light go around twice before coming back or three times before coming back and so on. So in principle, you actually have an infinite number of different images for every single thing in the sky. But they're all sort of being squished into here, into this small, crazy-looking region right around the Einstein ring. Um, and since these take different amounts of time also for the light to move around, basically this is giving you, if you like, um, you can see images of things. Not only are they the images of the same thing in multiple places, but they're the same thing at different ages. So this is from the movie Interstellar, um, which I'm saying this is a more realistic view, even though it's from a movie. So this, um, uh, the consulting for this movie was done to make sure that this was actually a very realistic uh, view of a black hole. Um, so here you have something which was not in the previous image, which is that you have a disk here. So you saw in the other talks tonight um, that lots of things have disks around them. Um, so that's one difference here. Another difference is that uh, this black hole is rapidly rotating, this one is not. So black holes can rotate, and this further affects um, how things behave around them. This is actually an image of a black hole. So this is what we first obtained just a few years ago. Um, it doesn't look quite like those other pictures, um, but this is very, very difficult to uh, obtain. And this is what we have. So we have images of exactly two black holes. Um, this one is uh, at the center of another galaxy. Um, and then we also have the image of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. It turns out that the latter, even though it's closer, is harder to image. Um, so this one is about a billion times the mass of our sun. So it's a very, very large black hole. OK, I'll stop there then. Um, so a lot of this is like generally like your intermediate black holes are forming from like these massive stars. How would you get a supermassive black hole like the one at the center of our galaxy? That's not completely understood. <laughs> is the short <laughs> answer. <laughs> yeah. So there are various ideas, but I think I think nobody really knows. Okay. Uh, how many black holes have been discovered or observed? Um, in terms of this kind of direct observation, only two, but there are many others that are. Um, whose existence has been inferred in various ways. Um, and I don't actually know a number uh, to give you. First of all, each galaxy has a supermassive black hole in the center. 
but that's the assumption, is it? Or has, like, I mean, this is what we see. I mean, there's not very there's not very direct evidence for most of them, I suppose. Yeah, but now people believe it. Yeah, it's for it's a belief. Minutes. But then we also have lots of uh, solar mass uh, mm. black holes, and I think uh, well, people still careful call them black hole candidates. Mm. Yeah. But uh, so so there are I'm more. There are at least uh, I don't know. I think nowadays in the galaxy it's around hundred. Mm. Yeah. So, so one other one other way of detecting black holes. Um, so this is um, via via radio telescope um, or large arrays of radio telescopes. Um, so besides trying to look at things in this way, um, people have detected uh, collisions of black holes actually using gravitational waves, um, and there the evidence is quite uh, strong that these are actually black holes. And so there's I don't know probably around uh, 50 of these now that have been seen. Okay. Maybe we leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you.